Hello, and thank you for exploring Lakehead International's videos. My name is Jordan, and I am the International New and Social Media Officer. I'm also the host of the Lakehead International Live series, a fun and informative way for you to connect with current international students, professors, and ask questions about admissions and everything Lakehead. You are about to watch a recording from one of our previous live sessions. If any questions arise throughout the video, please do not hesitate to comment below. If you would like to check out some of our upcoming live sessions, please head over to our website at lakeheadu.ca forward slash international dash live. Let's begin. So Lakehead University is a university located in Ontario, Canada, for those of you who don't know. We do have two campuses, one in Aurelia, Ontario, which is central Ontario, and one in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is northwestern Ontario. We have a student population of just over 8,000 students. Uh, um, a little over 1,500 of those are international students though, and we'll definitely chat about that and sort of where our students come from in just a moment here. Uh, but we are a fully comprehensive university with 10 academic faculties. As you know, the Academics Explored series is gonna get an opportunity to meet some of those faculties. We're gonna dive into it. Um, but on, on a larger scale, uh, to chat about sort of what is, who is Lakehead University and who are we? How are we recognized? Uh, we are recognized as the number one undergraduate research university in Canada. We've had that recognition for five years in a row now, so we're very proud of that, of course. Started in 2015 and it went up until last year. Uh, the announcement for this upcoming year is hopefully going to be released shortly here. And uh, knowing us, I I'm hoping that we're gonna get the sixth year in a row as well. We're also recognized as uh, the top Canadian university under 10,000 students in the entire world. That's a recognition from Times Higher Education, so something that we, of course, are very proud of to be recognized so highly across the entire world um, for that category. Um, for our graduates, 96.7% of our graduates are actually employed within two years of graduation. Um, that percentage rate there is significantly higher than the Ontario average for universities in Ontario. So it's another thing that speaks to sort of the education that we can provide, the opportunities, the experiential learning, and so much more, uh, which is definitely why I'm excited to dive into NRM today. Canada, we are also recognized as Canada's top 10 universities in the primarily undergraduate field. We are very proud of our small class sizes. So our typical student to professor ratios on the Thunder Bay campus are 15 students to one professor and 13 students to one professor on our Aurelia campus. And just like I mentioned with our international student population, just over 1500 students, I also would be remiss not to say that we are very proud to have those student bodies represent over 70 nations on campus. And of course that's always growing and we're continuing to expand that. Uh, we always welcome the diversity from around the world. Next, we're going to dive into academics at Lakehead. For those who may be on today's session, uh, who are simply still exploring, they haven't determined exactly what program they're interested in. They may not be sold on natural resources management or the programs offered, but you certainly want to understand the program offerings and consider it. Uh, firstly, I'll, I'll chat about our academic faculties. On your screen, you'll see all 10 of our academic faculties here at Lakehead University. Uh, we do have business administration, engineering, science and environmental studies, natural resources management, education, social sciences and humanities, health and behavioral sciences, law, medicine, and graduate studies. Of course, uh, we will be diving into natural resources management. Yesterday, we already hosted our first session, our very first premier Lakehead Live, Lakehead International Live event with the Faculty of Business Administration. We'll be doing another session with them this afternoon at 1 p.m. And then um, we will also be diving into uh, a vast majority of these faculties in the upcoming weeks. Without further ado though, let's dive into the Faculty of Natural Resources Management. Um, I myself uh, am not a graduate of this faculty. I'm actually a graduate of the Faculty of Business Administration. I know quite a bit about this faculty working at Lakehead, uh, meeting with current students, alumni, graduates, all that sort of stuff, and I've really gotten to know more about it. But at this point, I would love to pass it over to our, our special guests from NRM and have them speak about the faculty in, in depth. So I'll pass it over to either one of you. I can start. Uh, so you see a picture there, and of course, uh, that is part of a drone program. 
all undergraduates get into this. The fella holding the controller with the checkered shirt is now working for a company in Northern BC using UAVs or drones for forest management and forest inventory. And uh, everybody around them are gamefully employed. And so, uh, Matt, I'll let you continue a little bit about our faculty. Yeah, okay, so uh, thanks all. Yeah, so as you see here, the, the, this is part of all group of drones, which of course we, we very much pride ourselves on keeping up to date with te all technology. So like all group has a full array of drones from his quadcopters to his octocopters to his fixed wing aircraft to his underwater machines. Um, and like I said, students get to use this, which is quite unique about our faculty. My research labs, um, you know, typically students work in student labs, but our research labs as professors are most, a lot of the times off limits. Um, we actually bring our students in and they use the equipment that we use in our professional research, which gives them hands-on experience in, again, state-of-the-art labs. Pretty much every lab um, that does research in our facility has state-of-the-art equipment, new equipment. Um, so they're using they're using what's used in industry, which again, as all said, uh, John here, who's uh, um, educator is employed out west. Um, we have been very happy to say since I started here in 2003, we've had 100% employment of our graduates. Most times they're employed well before Christmas. The, the the companies come here in the fall, knowing that if they wait till after Christmas, there's very likely nobody left to employ. Um, so we have, we have people working all over Canada. We have people working overseas. One of our, our students who just graduated a couple of years ago, I see him on Facebook. He's in Vietnam teaching. Um, so it's, it's quite variety. It's quite a variety of what our students are able to do. And as this picture shows, we also pride ourselves on hands-on experiential learning. We have several woodlots, um, properties around Thunder Bay within half an hour of the city that we take our students to for labs. Um, so they get to get out and actually, you know, put things in their hands and touch it. And we find that's a really efficient way of, of teaching. And then we have very eager students. Um, Natural Resources Management is a, is, a, is a faculty that, you know, most of our students are here because they, you know, they love the outdoors. Um, they love aspects of the environment. And between our two programs, the EM and the uh, forestry, we teach all of that and we, we create managers. And so our students are very, very highly sought off, sought after by employers. Um, and again, we've got a, a teaching assistant here helping, but the students get to use this equipment as well. They don't just get to watch it. They actually get to use it and do projects. They do their final year thesis where this, these types of technologies are usually involved in that research projects. So it's, uh, it's very much um, a hands-on program and we're quite proud of that fact. And then of course we have, you know, we're a small program, but we have very dedicated faculty and we have a 100% open door policy. You don't need to make appointments to come and see us. Our doors are always open if we're there. If we're not there, it's probably because we're in a meeting or class. Um, even if I'm in, my, I'm in my labs, I leave wooden tags on my door to tell students where I am and they come see me there. So we're very open that way with our students. And like, I know all my students by their first name and all the students call me by my first name. We're quite informal that way, which makes it very comfortable for students. Um, and again, we just get along. They'll stop by and talk to us, even if it's not nothing to do with school. Um, so it's a very, we, and Alt says this a lot, we're very much like a family here and we, we take care of our, our students. And so um, you know, that's, I think that's a, a good basis of who we are and what we do. Certainly, and I, I can also uh, appreciate uh, sort of the, the students and by, by calling each other by the first name. It's funny, I, yesterday during one of our webinars, uh, it was brought up that students, even after their fourth year, sometimes still have to look up their student number when they're writing exams or if they have to submit a paper. They don't really know it because we're not a university that calls on students by their number. We call on them by their first name. We get to build these relationships with them and then of course, Come fourth year, like you mentioned, uh, most of our students already have job offers or have some serious prospects within the job market by Christmas time. And that probably speaks to the fact that uh, also students are able to, I'm sure, use their past professors or current professors 
as references. And, and those professors can truly speak to that student and what they've been doing in their classes. It's not simply, oh, student, uh, student X and you know they were in this class. You can say student Jordan was in my class and he did this and we worked on this project together. You can really speak to that experience and also the connection and I think that that's sort of what we stand for at Lakehead is that that small university experience with big university amenities and support still. Um, and I, I liked how you mentioned, uh, Dr. Leach, there that this in, in the photo in this case, it's a student assistant or a teacher's assistant, pardon me, uh, manning the drone and, and handling that. But of course, our students get involved in there. They have an opportunity to do the same thing. Of course, I was privy to this uh, exact photo shoot. So I, I've seen all the photos from it. And each one of the students on the screen here had an opportunity to use the drone and try it uh, with guidance from the teacher's assistants, of course. But um, in many cases, most of these students here were fourth year students who had plenty of experience and they didn't necessarily need someone leaning over their shoulder and guiding them. But uh, that's always important there, knowing that you have that support and, and that backup. Uh, diving, yeah, so, you know, oh, when it comes to these technologies, we're not using educational versions, we're using industrial versions of our tools. And uh, you're looking at one there, uh, very commonly used by industry. When John graduated, it was fully professionally qualified to look after a drone program in, in British Columbia. And, and I just wanna make one more comment here. One really fun part of our program, and I've been here a long time, I've been at Lakehead for 33 years. John, when he got married last year, sent me all kinds of pictures that he's been uh, with the pride and then he showed some trail pictures of him doing work with his new wife. And again, the graduates keep in touch with us, not just because they need something, but because their pride, their pride in what they're doing and the enthusiasm. And, and, and Matt is a perfect example of, of people keeping in touch with you, Matt, that mm -hmm. went out to do really interesting stuff and it's not just this is what i do for work this is my life and that is unique to at least to, to to our group we don't know what others do fully with this but the personal connections we get with the student body makes me feel really good at working at this place and matt is the same way certainly and and speaking about that i think that's a great segue into uh sort of talking about interacting with all the faculty and in our undergraduate program I know that students uh, are always studying all aspects within the natural resources management within their first year first two years part of me and then they really get to specialize here so I'll pass it back to you maybe to dive into that just a bit more and sort of talk about that stream and the importance what why do we value our students understanding all aspects before they then choose their specialization or their major yeah, I'll take this slide. It's a, it's a science-based professional faculty. So in the first two years, we feel that we know what's good for you for the first two years. So we put you into courses that you absolutely need to progress into third and fourth year. And for some students, maybe they decide they want to do something different. But the first two years, they're solid, science-based, you learn a lot and you get to know each other and, and the whole point the first two years for us to get to know who you are and for you to figure out who are you and, and what stream should you be on or in when you move on to years three and four. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, the whole point of this is to make sure that we don't let you flounder. We don't want you to take, well, you can take any course you want for extra credit, but we want you to take a solid foundation to feel secure in yourself as you move up in the years and as you move on to, to, to careers. Another point here worth mentioning, Alf, is that because we're a small faculty, I mean, we have 14 faculty members and our class sizes, as you mentioned, Jordan, are quite small. Um, so we, we have very personal you know, connection with our students as far as them knowing us and us knowing them. But in the first two years, I mean, because we're small, you know, we have clubs, uh, student society. We also have teams like the uh, Timber Timberwolves team, which is kind of woodsman competition stuff. I ha I'm the head coach of that group. 
And those those are across all four years com are involved in these things. So one of the nice things is that the first years and second years will mingle with the third and fourth years. And so they get to speak to them and find out what kind of jobs they've been getting, what sort of stuff, you know, how they've been doing in the third and fourth year. And they can share their, their knowledge and their experiences. And that helps the first couple years sort of direct themselves into what stream they might want to go into. Um, so again, being small is, is helps our students a lot because they, there's none of this, you know, fourth years don't mingle with the first years or anything. They all mingle together. Uh, and that makes them a, you know, a really tight group. And it also helps them as far as making decisions because they, they all talk to each other about where they've been working and they'll, you know, help others get summer jobs and what have you and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's an advantage of this faculty is, is our size. Of course. And then also speaking to the fact that you have first years and second years and essentially all years interacting and collaborating and connecting so that they're discussing career prospects they're discussing personal opinions. So they may be able to talk to you. Know, I've done this course. I was, I really enjoyed this. This is where I, I foresee myself going with that. That might help a first year decide how they're going to structure their second year and what major they might pick for their third year and continue on from there. But also just being the fact that uh, four years of separation in university uh, might not seem like too much, but when you are a first year and then you, you continue on to fourth year, if you've known someone that's now been in the job force for four years, they could be in a hiring position. They might remember you. You might have an established connection or relationship with them, which then allows you to lean on that and lean into it. And I know that our alumni are always proud to work with each other, and I'm sure that they would be even happier to hire each other if they're in that role or that uh, capacity to do so. It's funny you mentioned that, Jordan, because I get calls from former students who are working for companies now, and they, you know, they'll say, Matt, we have this person applied to us. Um, they put you as a reference. Let us know what you think. And, you know, 100% of the time, if I say, you know, what's the job? And they tell me, and I say, yeah, this student is 100% perfect for that job. Almost every time, they'll, they will get that job. They, they, oh, our former students will take advice from us as far as their students, and they, they trust what we tell them. So, I mean, there, there's a nice connection there. And we did, we, when, those, when these employers come back in early in the year, like normally they'd be on campus this time of year, a lot of the companies, the ones who come back are our former students. Certainly. And actually, uh, speaking of that, uh, towards the end of this month, I know that we are going to be hosting our very first virtual career fair, uh, which we're excited to. That's hosted by the Student Success Center. And I've already started to uh, uh, explore that and look at uh, what employers are going to be participating in that. So I'm very excited to see that uh, I recognize quite a few names within uh, the forestry sector and natural resources management sector uh, that I'm sure they'll be uh, chatting with our uh, fourth year students and all, all years really because it's not just students that are looking to graduate and get that full-time employment these are students that are also looking for part-time opportunities summer opportunities all sorts of stuff I just want to mention something when I look at this picture I feel pretty good the the girl on the far left with looking at an iPad her right hand has a ring she right now in that picture she was a graduate student with me and that ring is something she got when she graduated from the forestry program it's a it's a ring that all our graduates gets it's a ring that designates the profession whether you're em or forestry and uh, she was here as a teaching assistant but she now works at huntsville uh dealing with uh, protective uh, issues dealing with insect infestations and whatnot but it's a good example of, of professionalism. She's been involved in all kinds of promotion efforts for her because she really feels that she can help students when they come out of our program. And the company she works for in Huntsville, um, they constantly look for student summer employment possibilities. And again, she's a good example of the pride that students put into the program. Uh, and, and as I said, that ring uh, is something that uh, our graduates wear with pride. We all have them. Yeah, awesome. Well, <laughs> thank you for sharing that insight. I, I hadn't known that fact, and now I feel like I need to scramble and write that down to share that next time we might not be joined with you, but thank you for sharing Jordan, that. The interesting thing there is, you know, like engineers get a PN ring, 
Mm -hmm. Foresters get a, a forestry ring and it's it's a professional program. So they become like an engineer after two years of employment, they become registered professional foresters where their signature is a legal document and pretty much all industry consultants want RPFs on staff. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, I think that's a good segue into the actual uh, specifics of the program. So what can students graduate with? Right now, we're going to chat about undergraduate programs, and then we'll move into the graduate programs. I will pass it back to uh, either one of you to chat about the difference between our, our forestry and our environmental management program. And then if we could do a brief overview of each of the specializations or maybe some of some unique opportunities within those specializations. Yeah, like Matt, you can take the beginning of this. Uh, do yeah. the forestry, not do the EM. Okay. So the the Honors Bachelor of Science in Forestry, the HPCF, is our is a fully accredited program through the Canadian uh, Forestry Accreditation Board, um, and we do have full accreditation. We just received it again a couple of years ago. And as you've already mentioned, the first two years are common, and then in the third year, you declare a specialization. And on the forestry side, we have forest management, which is probably our main mainstream there, and then forest health and protection, and then forest products and marketing. The, the last one I run being the wood science prof here. Um, but what these are, and you'll, within, across both of our programs, the one you know, underlying point is we produce essentially managers. Um, and they, they run, if you will, run the show, so to speak. So forest management is our main program. And that's where the people are, um, you know, they work for big industry, they work for uh, government, they work for consultants, they work for NGOs, um, they can work in the cities, um, because all cities have foresters. Um, but they basically, they're they're managers who, you know, like the big industries in town here, a lot of them work in the woodlands division, um, manage large licenses, forest licenses. If they go to other provinces, they're doing the same thing, or even overseas, they can do the same thing. So it's it's our, our main program, I'd say. Um, and it's, again, it produces managers who are responsible for taking care of our forest, everything from writing management plans, you know, that are how we manage our forest sustainably, to taking care of city city forests to maybe working more with NGOs or con private consultants that can be a variety of anything um, that consultants do. So it's it's a very open field, if you will. With with the training, of course, you're, you're capable of taking any job in forestry. Forest health and protection looks a bit more at the aspects, um, basically like I'll just describe for uh, the one former student, looking at things like entomology, pathology, fire, disturbances that can affect our forests. And that's both at landscape levels in the forest, but also in cities. And currently right now, a big thing in Ontario is the emerald ash borer. Um, so we work with the city um, looking at that. Um, that former student did her work, some of her work here in Thunder Bay, and then as well her master's work in southern Ontario looking exactly at that. So in this program, they, they get a lot of information and a lot of coursework, if you will, that allows them to manage more from that side of things, protection, which is, again, can involve bugs, it can involve fungal, um, fire, all sorts of disturbances. And the last one, force products and marketing, of course, it, all three of these, I should say, all allow you to become an RPF. Okay, it, there, you can any all three of these can apply to any forest management job or what have you. It's just that within the specializations, it comes down to a lot of a few courses and then oh, the slides moved a few courses as well as um, electives. Okay, and in those electives is where they can specialize. So in the forest products and marketing, they take things like advanced wood science. Um, you know, they can take uh, portable milling program courses, um, property testing. Uh, marketing, entrepreneurship, stuff like that. Okay, so it's meant to look more at the what do we do with wood after we've managed it and harvested it and put it through mills. But all three of these allow you to be a forester. Um, the, the core courses are the same amongst them. It's the added courses that delve into certain specializations. And like I say, the jobs for these, um, the ones who come through the forest products, the stream that I run, a lot of them are, they work 
all over the place. Like you say, for consultants, they work for a big industry, they work for governments. And again, our, our graduates are very much prized by employers. Um, they love the diversity of um, knowledge that they have and their abilities to work in a variety of areas within this, this industry and this profession. So I think in a nutshell, that's sort of what these are. Um, I don't know awesome. if, you, if you want to add anything else or is, if you- Well, let me describe then the Honors Bachelor of Environmental Management. Again, uh, Matt hinted that, well, not just hinted that management is the key and it's key on this side also. It's, it's, a, it's a professional program. Uh, you do not automatically get the registered professional forester, but there's a bridge uh, program for that after graduation. Uh, the reason why you don't get that out of this one is that there's additional courses added for these particular things and something had to give. But they're professional programs and the most popular one is the wildlife conservation and management. But we get two kinds of people that go into that one. One are the people that likes the, uh, the fuzzy animal and then there's people that like the hunting aspect of it. And both are fully valid. And uh, wildlife conservation and management, it deals with fisheries, uh, ungulate, uh, like moose and deer management, both for making sure that they're sustainable populations, but also the fact that both uh, there's a harvest involvement here, both for indigenous people and for sports uh, hunting and whatnot. Um, then again, the whole thing is primarily focused on making sure that a person going through that program can function in the big picture of crown land management in Ontario. Students have a choice after graduation to become a certified wildlife biologist. Uh, all the courses needed for that are in there and that's a North American designation. Conservation planning and management are for those students that are uh, more focused on the big issue of climate, and how, for example, big uh, forested states like what we have in Ontario, we are dealing with crown land, which technically the public owns the land. There's a lot of issues of uh, sustainable land use, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But for conservation planning and management, there is a push among civil society or people to protect more areas, protect them for the sake of particularly northern areas in Canada and Ontario, uh, protect them for climate change, protect them for social and cultural values. And so students that go into that program have a slant towards that even before they come. So we make sure that there is a place for that. And again, management is the key point here. This is not a touchy-feely program. This is a professional program where you learn hard skills. Sustainable land use is dealing with bigger pictures of both in Canada and abroad. Uh, many students that got into that wrote their thesis on land use in other parts of the world where there's a lot of threat to uh, sustainability of people, both in Asia, Africa, South, South America, and what have you. Uh, we are, trying to make sure that people in sustainable land use understand that a big part of a graduate in that program also have, have a lot of people skills. So if you're the kind of person who wants to sit in a basement in a lab with a white lab coat, don't take that stream. You have to really engage with public for that one. And that's the thing, our six streams in the two programs are there to make sure we can sort of custom fit the beginning of your career based on who you are. And, and not everybody has a people slant to their being. Not everybody has a technology slant to who they are. And we have six streams to make sure we can fit you in. And you have two years before you get to that, where we help you figure out what stream should you be in. And let's face it, students that start in the EEM program may realize that, darn it, I'm in the wrong program. Well, there's no big deal to change over. And same thing, people in the forestry degree may decide, darn it, I'm in the wrong stream. Well, then come and tell us and we move you over. So we have a fair amount of interaction back and forth between these two streams. 
And again, there are professional streams, all six, with management being the key aspect of this. One of the things too, Ulf, that we encourage, or I encourage particularly, is the students in the EM, I say, you know, you, you, they've chosen a path, but I said it's wise for them to understand what the students in the forestry side are doing. And same with the forestry side, it's wise for them to understand what the EM students are. And they all, they're always chatting, like I say, they mingle a lot. And that allows them to understand when they get to work, what, where the other side or where the other groups are coming from. And they have an understanding of it and they know why they're doing things. So it, it, I think in, in their professional careers, it makes them a lot more versatile in how to deal with situations, especially in, a, in an industry where there can be, you know, significant amounts of conflict, depending on you know, what's happening, where it's happening and who's involved. I mentioned earlier, if you don't have people skills, you should maybe be careful which stream you pick. But we make a point over the four years to get every student to be more comfortable to present themselves both in writing and verbally to be able to conduct meetings with the public meetings with other professionals and so forth. You absolutely need to have skills in that area. You need to write well, you need to speak well. And our program makes a real effort to make sure that you get that. Some students are so nervous when it comes to presentations. And we see, and it's really fun, you will see throughout the four years how most of the students calm down, become more proficient at doing public, public presentations. And again, that's, it's a professional program and that's part of being a professional to be able to present your ideas and to present your ideas in places where maybe not everybody agrees with what you have to say. Awesome. Well, well I really appreciate diving into the specializations. I think for our viewers and our uh, prospective students who are interested in these programs, they'll have a good idea as to you know, the different routes. And as you mentioned, being that there's six streams uh, and taking into consideration each of those streams and sort of what, what that involves, what that's going to have you be doing as, as a professional. Uh, that's an important consideration, of course. I think this goes back to the slide previous to this and the fact that studying all aspects of uh, natural resources management in the undergraduate uh, fields for the first two years helps you get the knowledge in these six streams and helps you better decide sort of where you want to go and where you want to take your career. You really get to understand sort of what you're passionate about uh, and that that's the, the flexibility and the customization right there is the fact that we're, we're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to say you, you should do this stream because it's the most popular. We want to see our students pick a stream that they're passionate about and they ha are tried and truly successful in because we, we know that that will equal to be a successful graduate who is uh, proud of their degree. And I think it also goes back to uh, what Alf mentioned, the pride that our alumni feel when they, they graduate out of this faculty and from Lakehead University, and then we continue to interact with them. Um, I, I will hover on that topic too, Leon, just to uh, get an opportunity to chat about graduate programs. We both have uh, the science and forestry program, which is a master's program. And then we do have a doctoral program, which is the doctor of philosophy in forest sciences. Um, I will let you both chat about these programs and then uh, we'll dive into some of the unique learning opportunities and cooperative advantage as well. Yeah, let me take this one. We don't need to talk too much about that here at this level, but uh, many students choose to either after graduation or after some years in the real world, to come back for additional education. And of course we offer a whole slate of things. So we have two master's programs. Uh, one is a thesis based, takes two plus years to do. Two, sometimes it takes longer than two. And then they have a, a course based masters that uh, for now have been 12 months, no thesis, but we're changing it to 16 months to add more uh, professional streams in that. Then we have a PhD, you know, that's down the line for some people, uh, but it's a uh, rock solid uh, doctor philosophy and four sciences. Uh, let me just quickly mention this. We are not competing with other schools like this across Canada. There are seven uh, undergraduate forestry program and I use the word forestry because that's forestry means stewardship. So we broke that into six streams under environmental management and natural resources management under forestry. 
But anyway, there's six others across the land at the undergraduate level. And let me tell you this, they are all good. So we're not telling that, whoa, they're, they're garbage, they're all good. I'm a graduate of UBC Forestry. Uh, Matt is a graduate of UNB in New Brunswick. And we know that our programs stand up against some of the biggest schools. The biggest school is UBC Forestry. There's no comparison. It's always been like that. But anyway, let's not dig into too much of the graduate program at this session because uh, that's down the line. We have quality programs. Keep in mind, there are other quality programs across the land also. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate chatting about these briefly. And of course, to any of our viewers, if you're watching this now or watching this as a recording, uh, you can certainly learn more about any one of the programs you mentioned today on our website. If you visit us at lakeheadu.ca forward slash explore dash nrm you will uh, be able to explore all these programs and learn more about uh, the very specific details the admission requirements all that sort of stuff and of course our recruitment advisors who are based around the world are always happy to chat more i'll uh, pass it over to hector to chat about the cooperative education advantage uh, and there's a few points here that i want him to touch on so i'll put them up on the screen um, and then we'll uh, continue on and chat about unique learning opportunities within NRN. Excellent. Thank you, Jordan. So what is comparative uh, education? Comparative education is a formal part of a curriculum that integrates classroom study with work experience. This usually gives um, students and international students a competitive advantage as they gain work experience in their field of study before they graduate. And this often helps them to find better jobs more easily and attain better salaries or higher salaries upon graduation. Um, our faculty of uh, natural resources management uh, is one of those that offers programs with co-op opportunities. Uh, the Honors Bachelor of Science in Forestry and the Honors Bachelor of Environmental Science or Environmental Management, sorry. Um, and co-op opportunities are full-time work terms that can vary between four and 16 months. Uh, during that time, students will be working full time um, and will only pay for a COP uh, placement fee or participation fee uh, instead of the full time uh, tuition fees during you know, the COP the co placement. Um, the participation fee is roughly $786 um, for the first work ter term and uh, half of that for the consecutive work terms. Um, students can expect to earn around 20 to 25 dollars um, an hour um, and we have over 140 national and international partners um, that are hiring students from our co-op program all over the world um, some potential employers um, are the government of canada um, companies like monsanto energy companies like bc hydro uh, shell exxon enbridge um, and well as you can see here ibm blackberry um, uh, financial institutions, um, we will assist students uh, with the job search by providing um, resume and cover letter critiques, interview preparation workshops, and giving them access to a job bank that we have created especially for students participating in our co-op program and that is only available through our My Success portal. Um, students are encouraged to also be active job seekers, so they have different venues to actually find a job or a co-op experience that really resonates with them. Um, international students will need a co-op uh, work permit um, and we have also an immigration advisor on campus that will help them uh, go through the application process um, while they are here. Uh, the eligibility to uh, participate in a co-op program uh, vary depending on the, on, on the program of study but they're mostly based on students grade and uh, the work term study they choose. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for covering that, Hector. Uh, something to mention here for anyone who is interested in exploring those admission requirements into the co-op program. Uh, as Hector mentioned, it is program specific uh, and that does vary. So if you visit lakeheadu.ca forward slash co-op, so C-O-O-P, um, you'll be able to explore those requirements based on the program that you are specifically interested in. And like I've said before, our recruitment advisors who are based around the world 
are of course uh, trained in co-op and, and they do know more about it, so they can certainly help you if you wanted to uh, chat with them directly. Moving on, I wanted to chat about unique learning opportunities. I also uh, do acknowledge that uh, we have uh, about 10 more minutes on today's session, so I will uh, power through these ones. Uh, this photo here is actually from one of our field school opportunities. So I'll pass it back over to uh, Alf or uh, Dr. Leach there to chat about. Yeah, so uh, there are many, many opportunities in our program to leave the classroom, to go out to the field in some capacity. And formally, every year, all our students are doing a two-week, what we call field school. And that field school changes from year to year. In the first year, you primarily do local field schools. Primarily looking at examples here, we are learn the, uh, the flora and fauna of uh, the region we're in, the Northwestern Ontario part of the boreal forest. In the second year, you migrate more into a regional scenario, uh, focus a lot more on the big issue of ecology. Uh, things are functioning. Third year, you go further out again and you go into parks management, wildlife management, and we tend to focus those on taking advantage of the many, many provincial and national parks that we have in, in Canada. The fourth year, we try to get you out of the region. So we have gone to the Alberta oil sands. We have gone to uh, the East Coast to look at the very different approach to forest management in New Brunswick. We do uh, Southern Ontario scenarios, so looking at conservation management, woodlot management, uh, uh, something completely different than what we have in Northwest Ontario. And then of course, either third or fourth year, we give students an opportunity, if they so wish, to go international. And thus far, we've been to Europe, we've been to Croatia, the Czech Republic, Finland, Sweden, Norway, uh, we've been to South Africa, Ghana. We've been to Ecuador a couple of times. We've been to India a couple of times. We've been to China a couple of times. And these are not something you need to go sell your car or more that your future for. It's very, very affordable for students to be part of the international field schools. Uh, the next field school international will be Ghana, West Africa. And you awesome. just mentioned Errol, one of the reasons we take our, our senior students on these international trips is to expose them to how the rest of the world looks at resources. So they're always, they always involve trips to, you know, industry, to the big mills, to small mills, to government operations, to environmental groups, to policy makers, to tourism people, um, you know, everything we can cover that literally looks at wildlife, all that that looks at what we teach in all of our programs. When we do these trips, we make a point of ensuring that every student has something and that we can bring all of it together in one trip, which is, is very useful. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. I said we went to the Alberta oil sands. Well, there is a European version of that too in Estonia. So what do you think we did? We hauled over to Estonia and look at that. We also looked at the indigenous forest management in Mexico, that was last year, and so, this really is life changing for some students. We're not promoting that you leave Canada, but it's really important to see that there are different ways around the world. This is from, this is from uh, either- This is actually the Mexico. Uh, this is the Mexico. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And on, we always make sure we do our homework. We will never ever put a student at harm's way. So we do our homework, we do the side business in advance of these things. And last time we hauled over to Africa, Matt took a bunch of students to Africa. And uh, again, this is a big, big part of our program. And it's not for everybody. Um, but these students that went to Mexico, they hauled up a thousand dollars for that, all in. So just so you know, this is not something you need to go beg your parents for or have a side job to be able to afford. It's very, very affordable to be part of these field schools. We do that through some endowments we have. So the students pay a certain amount and we cover the rest. And that's how, that's how we're able to bring students like this overseas. And that could be anywhere from like a group this size, a dozen or so up to, I think the maximum we've done is about 20. And beyond that, logistics get a little difficult. But uh, this is something the students remember. When we have students come back to employ, you know, as employers, 
um, I, I'll sit and chat with them because they're our former students and they always bring up their trips that they took international. It's something that they remember, I think, forever. For sure, yeah. And I know uh, actually a few of my close friends who are from the Thunder Bay area and have graduated out of uh, the forestry program specifically. They actually did one of your international field school uh, opportunities in China and then they continued on and they did a, a second international field school uh, I believe it was in Europe. I, I can't remember the country off the top of my head, but uh, even today they, they still talk about those opportunities and we can connect with my international experience uh, and my knowledge of those markets and their that's one of, experience yeah. to travel there. I'd like to mention one little aspect. Some students then decide, darn it, maybe I should do a whole semester somewhere else. And we don't have that in a formal setting, but if they deal with some of us, included particularly with me, we can set up unique opportunities where you go to a different location in the world to four months with courses that I will then assess if you can count them for a, for a credit for credit here. So thus far we had people go to, uh, to Ghana, Sweden, Norway, the Norway one, she wanted to do fish farming because she ended up, she wanted to do environmental assessment in Canada and she thought that Norwegian fish farming thing was, would be my thing. So she went to Norway for four months, did her thesis with me on fish farming. You must have, what does that have to do with natural resource management? Everything. Fish farming is part of the environmental approach to how you do sustainability around the world. She is now an environmental assessor for mining company in Ontario. The, the neat thing that they're doing with this now is our, our groups, we actually do a lot of multidisciplinary type research. So all group and my group, we work together and I work with engineers, chemical engineers, civil engineers, people in business department. You know, we, we don't just hide in a little bubble. We, we utilize what this, this university has and the fact that everyone's quite friendly um, to work together. Um, but as far as our labs are concerned, like say ALF has state of the art, they're, they're, they're one of the um, registered uh, training groups for uh, drones, um, which everybody who flies a drone over 250 grams has to have a, a training certificate for it. And so they, they, they're involved with industry work, students get involved with this, and they have state of the art drones, they have LIDAR attached to their drones, different sensors for different um, research um, projects, whether they be, you know, thermal sensors for looking at wildlife or um, other sensors for picking up weeds in agricultural systems or for looking at uh, defoliation of bugs in forests and stuff. So, I mean, we keep on top of stuff. My lab is wood science. I have state-of-the-art uh, universal wood testing machines, um, portable milling equipment. So we can literally take trees in the bush, we can cut them down, we can have all the equipment to take them down, bring them back to the um, our facilities, mill them up into what we need, and then process them down in woodworking shops that I have as my testing labs. I have a portable milling operation, um, as well as, you know, we're in order, if there's not something that satisfies what we need. So for my group, I developed, we developed the Wood Science app, and it's unique globally on how this app works. It's, it's creating data that other people haven't been able to figure out how to do yet. And so we're, we're at the cutting edge of research in our, in our labs. And like I say, this app, part of the work I'm doing in West Africa and Ghana that we're, we're firing up our relationship there again, we have five MOUs with universities in their senior research organizations. And they want both the drone technology that ALT has for doing research as well as training, which will involve undergrad and graduate students um, as well as they want to map their entire forest using my wood science app, which is a method of understanding the wood quality of trees at the individual tree level and at entire landscape levels that we can create these. So, I mean, in our pathology lab, Dr. Hutchinson, same thing. He's got state-of-the-art facilities for looking at this type of stuff. And he has a, you know, a library of, of uh, fungi and that that he, he does work with all sorts of people. And the same applies to our you know, ecology researchers with Dr. Chen and um, fire researchers with Dr. Wang, entomology with Dr. Henny. I mean, literally we have facilities to look at any aspect of force management and, and things we do within this industry, whether it be, you know, heavy industry or heavy on the environment side. Um, so, I mean, we pride ourselves that we have 
not just state of the art, but current state of the art. So it's equipment that when, like all said, when students leave and they go work for industry, if they're doing drawing work, they're using the drones in industry that we have here. So it's not a new learning curve. They go in and they can show the people there how to use what they have. Um, the same as the wood science. I mean, they come out of here with exceptional knowledge of wood quality and industry. This is something they need. And so they love our, our graduates because of the wealth of knowledge they have and the fact that we teach them a lot of stuff encompassed um, within across all of our programs and then specializations. Um, but that knowledge where they bring everything together, that makes very powerful employees because they, they understand all aspects and they, they may focus in one area, but the rest of the information they also have so they can see linkages between things. And that's what makes our students highly sought after. They're, they're, they're thinkers and they're innovators and they can solve, they, they're good at problem solving because they have that wealth of knowledge from the curriculum that we provide. Um, awesome. So, I mean, you combine that teaching plus the hands-on both in our labs and in, out in the woods in our wood lots. Um, I mean, we literally have the whole package and we're very fortunate being in Thunder Bay in that we sit on the edge of the boreal forest. Like we, our wood lots, and these are thousands of acres, um, we don't have to drive any more than 20, 25 minutes to get to the furthest ones. You know, two minutes off campus and you're literally in the bush here. Um, so we're quite fortunate. On one side, we have all sorts of forest. On the other side, we have a honking big puddle they call Lake Superior, which, you know, allows us to look at all aspects of things. So it, it, we're quite uniquely situated and we are the only forestry, um, full forestry university program in Ontario at a university here. Um, so that puts us unique as well. But I think our location is what really combined with our facilities and our size and everything else makes us a, an ideal program for somebody who's interested in, in uh, forestry and environmental management. I just want to make a quick, quick comment. Matt mentioned Lake Superior. We also have thousands of lakes because we have a glacial history. This faculty, we fly in the water too. So we're going below the surface and we have a very strong drone program. They don't call them drones, they call them rovers. And we do go below the surface to map fish habitat. We're also getting into sonar program to map shallow ponds uh, for mining tailing ponds and whatnot. So uh, this is a place to come if you have a technical slant, if you have a people slant to your thing, if you have an environmental slant to your thing, we welcome all folks of life. And, and, and we're pretty proud, proud of what we do. And we have fun doing it. Life is not about looking to Friday afternoon. It's about also looking with pride in Monday morning for the week you're going to do and the joy you're going to have in making a difference when it comes to the big issues of climate change, sustainability, what have you. A good awesome. example of that, Alf, if I could just spend less than a minute here. I have a course, my portable milling, it's Friday afternoons. It goes from 1230 to 530. And to see the excitement in students on a Friday afternoon taking a course that's pretty rare. They don't want to leave. I've had some classes run till 7.30 because they, they wanted to finish what they were doing. I said, we can do it next week. And no, 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 no. And we were like, we'd have headlights on our trucks running so that they could finish. And that's, that's how excited they get about this program. And I mean, that's, that says a lot on a Friday afternoon if they're willing to stay that late. Yes, certainly. I, I couldn't have said it better, my, better myself and also uh, just sort of to reiterate some of those, those key points. There's the fact that we're situated uh, in the heart of Canada and also so close to the boreal forest and one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, but also to couple that with state-of-the-art and current state-of-the-art technologies, equipments, labs, facilities, all that sort of stuff is something that truly speaks to the experience that NRM can provide to our students. Uh, with an environmental management uh, or forestry degree, um, students can expect to play an active role in the increasingly complex task of creating a sustainable tomorrow. Um, we can uh, see here on this list uh, that we have um, urban foresters, wildlife ecologists, uh, GIS forester, invasive species specialist, um, planning foresters, um, and they often work together in all aspects of stewardship of public lands and, um, for example, studying um, how life, uh, wildlife uh, evolves, I guess, um, in different areas uh, or, you know, plants and all those sort of things. Uh, and 
they can work not only uh, on hands-on sort of like positions, but also in the management, uh, like they were mentioning, um, of uh, planning uh, for, for, you know, um, organizations or even uh, government, um, government, uh, uh, sorry, I lost track of what I was going to say for a second. Uh, organiz um, Help me here, Jordan, for a second. Yeah, I was, uh, was going to say, uh, I'll jump in here and I'll say that uh, <laughs> I heard Alf and uh, Matt mention quite a number of times the management, the management piece. And, and I think within all of the careers listed on the screen or a vast majority of them, of course, this is not an exhaustive list of the opportunities. You'll see that uh, lots of these are tied into that management piece and they truly, um, they, can, they connect students to managing stewardship, they connect to managing conservation, wildlife, forestry environments, natural environments in general. Um, but then there all also are other uh, paths that lead into more conventional office jobs, such as you'll see on the screen, community economic development officer uh, might not necessarily have uh, that role in, in the forest and marking trees, who, who's going to be cutting down what, not, not mapping it out, but they might be establishing more on that high level government scale that uh, Hector was mentioning, sort of that development. How are we going to, as a government uh, and or as a municipality, as a city, connect jobs and, and create growth within our economy? Um, Let so me just a, intersect here for a second. For sure. My first forestry job had nothing to do with trees. I got hired by Alberta Environment, Water Resources, in Calgary and Edmonton. I worked with farmers for flood and drought from an airborne point of view. My job was to figure out from airborne imagery and field visits where the water goes. You can't get rid of water, you gotta move it. And so I was fully qualified to do that job with a forestry degree to look at where water goes from an airborne perspective and again, I felt really proud that I could work with these civil engineers that primarily occupy that area. And again, then I moved on to Northern BC doing insect damage control, again, from satellites and airborne. And then I went back to school eventually. Matt spent, how many years in Australia, Matt, did you? 10 years. 10 years. Our faculty is from all over the place. I was born and raised in Sweden. Matt spent, uh, almost a dozen years in Australia. We have people that have experienced all around the world in so many different aspects of natural resources management. Plus that all, a lot of us, like some of us are from other parts of the world. I mean, I'm Canadian, but I did my doctorate and worked in Australia for a bunch. But then I also do work in South Africa and West Africa and, and still with groups in Australia. And we have people working all over the planet, which assists us with our field school but it also gives our students a real good view of what's happening elsewhere. And I bring that into my class, my classwork, you know, what the Southern Hemisphere is doing because they're an important competitor. Um, so. Awesome. And uh, by the sounds of it, of course, within our faculty's reach to uh, their experience that they bring to the table and knowledge uh, will also be a great resource for students to be able to chat with someone. If they know that they're maybe uh, interested in becoming a GSI forester, we might have a faculty member that uh, previously held that position or, or can really speak to that position and give them more insight as to what they can anticipate in the career uh, and job market. So last but not least, I'll, I'll pass it on to Hector to cover um, an outstanding alumni, Sharon here, who is actually a past employee of ours. Uh, and we always love chatting about her and uh, chatting about what, which, what she's doing now. Yeah, so, so Sharon uh, is an example of one of our international students who obtained a Bachelor of Environmental Management and a Master's uh, in Forestry. Um, and she went on to working for the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, which is an organization that focuses on the growth of existing and emerging economic sectors such as renewable energy and services, agriculture, um, water technologies. And um, Sharon, uh, in a recent testimonial, uh, mentioned that she really enjoys studying in small classes um, because they offer her more opportunities to participate um, and connect with you know, her peers and her professors. And that the field school, that the field school was the best hands of experience she had. And it talks a little bit about what it has been discussed already uh, throughout the, the webinar, right? Uh, just giving them the opportunity to have that 
hands-on experience with the help of their instructors. Thank you for checking out today's video. If you have any questions, you can always comment below. Stay connected and follow us on our social media channels to stay informed about upcoming webinars and get an insider sneak peek of Lakehead University. See you next time.